Yeah. All right. Cue some music. We'll give them a minute or two. They're like about 9.03, 9.04. There we go. Hello, everyone. We will get started momentarily. Give everyone a chance to come on in and then rename yourself as you get situated. If you'd like to include pronouns or a um, social media handle or where you're from. You say you like the wind blowing through your head. Morning, everyone. The sun goes down. Where are we all logging in from while we are waiting to get started? Where are we logging in from? Texas sun. Richmond, Virginia. I have relatives there that I'm finding. Well, come on, go with me to the sun goes down. Chicago, I was just there um, a couple years ago. New York City, Austin, Texas. Whoa, Calgary. Whoa, okay, I see. From Columbus, Ohio. I was just in Ohio um, in December. My great aunt turned 100. Um, so I was there in uh, Cleveland to celebrate with her. We have Vancouver, Seattle, Minneapolis, Lexington. Sonora, Mexico, Canada again, New Hampshire. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Has everyone DNA tested? Let's talk about that. Like, can we put that in the chat? Yes or no? Yes, if you have. To get an idea of the crowd. Yes, no. Not yet, no. Okay. Yes, 23 and me. Right, update off that music and just before we get started really quickly i'm megan on your field trips guide if you have any technical problems during this field trip send me a message and we'll try to get you sorted out so you can have the best experience there's a few tips in the um, chat and if you're available and able to right now we'd love to ask you to turn on your camera just for a moment to say hello and to see who we're in the room with today and then i am going to turn this over to shelly Hello, everyone. I see cameras coming on just for a minute. Give me a little little camera action. See some faces while I am talking, not just talking to the, the, the stratosphere. <laughs> and we're going to get started today with our genetic legacy. And let me get our... One second, sorry. Da, 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 da. This is not what I want. I am so sorry, you guys. This is weird. Um, while we are getting ready, if you have an ancestry account, a lot of the information that I'm going to give you today is going to be from relates directly to ancestry. Um, and their database. And the reason for that is it is the most user-friendly and it is the largest database. And so it just gives me the best um, start in order to share with you. If I could get some thumbs up that you can see my presentation. Yes, thank you. All right, awesome. We will get started then. So as I said, we are our genetic legacy. We are a nonprofit publishing house. We are focused on publishing BIPOC history and context, BIPOC legacy and context. So much of BIPOC, which is black, indigenous and people of color, our histories have been erased because of the lack of documentation. And so that has been a large part of my motivation. And it works out because that's that real complex genealogy and those same principles can be applied across the board. So we can all find our common ground, our commonalities and find out that, you know, where we all originate from because that information is so valuable across the board, um, across all ethnicities. And so that's what I work to make available to people. 
I am Shelly Baxter. I am the founder and CEO of Our Genetic Legacy. And today I will be your presenter. Please, if you have questions as we go along, ask those questions in the chat and I will have question and answer periods um, at least twice during the presentation. So ask the questions as we go along. If they're your personal questions, I will answer them as well. So just put those questions in as they relate to building your family tree. Now, when you start building your tree, many of you who have not DNA tested, which works out because this first portion is going to show you how you start building a tree, not using the DNA, just using what you know. So we are actually going to start with an obituary that I inherited from my grandmother. Um, when she passed away, I took all her stuff because I'm the family historian and I took it all. <laughs> and so um, if anybody wants to see it, they have to come visit me. So this is an obituary for McKinley Williams. He is an uncle of mine. Um, we're going to look at the inside of that. And this is gonna be the information that we start with. This is what we know about you know this particular person. So we know from here, we know where he was born. We know the date. We know when he, um, when he passed away. We know the name of his wife. We know the name of his nine, well, actually we know the name of eight children because they put nine children to the union, but only eight are listed. And this is some of the um, realities of obituaries and other documents is it's based on self-reporting the information that is shared, you know, that is known and sometimes it's shared, sometimes it's not. So we take every document with a grain of salt and we have enough evidence. So one document is never enough evidence. We add more to um, bolster whatever argument that we're trying to make. It says other survivors. It shows that we have three sisters. We have four brothers and we have an aunt. Now the four brothers-in-law, six sisters-in-law, those they're not named, but we have a lot of information here. And so what we're gonna do now is we are actually going to build trees in real time. And the purpose of that is because sometimes we have misconceptions about how long it takes to build a tree. <laughs> it looks like it's so easy, you just, you know, click, 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 and you look at the research and it's just, it's all there. You're ready to go. It's not the way it works in real life. So here we are, we're gonna spend 15 minutes. I'm actually gonna set a timer because research can take forever. And so we're gonna set this timer for 15 minutes and I'm gonna show you how we start building a tree. So the first name we're gonna have in here is McKinley W. Williams. That's the name that we have in our tree for our obituary. We know he's deceased, he's male. We know that his birthday is 16 February, 1900. We know that he was born in Win, Alabama. We're gonna put Clark County just because I know that that's how it comes up. Um, he passed away on the 1st of September, 1973. Once again, he's still in Win. You'd be surprised at how many wins there are, right? Alabama, there we go, continue. We're gonna add a father. It says Mr. and Mrs. Anthony Williams. So we don't know her first name. So we're just gonna put the father's name that we have, Anthony Williams. We know he's deceased, he's male. We don't know for sure where he's born. It does not say that, but we can assume that he was deceased in Clark County as well. Now it's gonna ask you to name your tree and decide to whether or not to make it public or private. 
When you do not know for sure the line that you are working on, I suggest that you make your tree private. The reason for that is because when you have a public tree that has a mistake, other people will copy that mistake and it will grow exponentially in time. You will not, when you correct your mistake, be able to come back and find all the people who have already copied it to correct your error. If you have a tree that you are comfortable with, because I definitely recommend, I redo my trees all the time. So this is actually a tree that I'm familiar with. Doing it again does not bother me. I do my trees over and over again throughout the year because new documentation becomes available. As new information becomes available, just as I'm learning more and more about trees, when I go back and I look at documents, I look at them differently every time. There's always more information to be found. So we're gonna put here, not allow others. We, it's still a searchable tree. So we'll come up in through lines, but it will not, it'll show up as private and people will have to ask you for permission. You can give that permission with the caveat of, hey, this is what I'm working on. I'm not 100% sure. This is where I'm at. But then you're able to give that explanation before they start. So we're gonna put here, CM2 because there's another tree that is, we're going to show. Save tree. So then we start here. So this is where we go. And what I'm actually going to do is because I have populated a tree with the names that we have from the obituary, at least to save that time. So we have all of the names that we have in the tree and from the obituary. We're gonna look at this profile. I was looking at the profile, we see, oh, McKinley already has 11 hints. Now we know that McKinley is an uncle. We want to get to the generational level, which is the grandparent level, because that's when you look at the CM counts and the estimated relationships, it's always based on the generation level. So it's not the cousin or the uncle level, it's going to be the grandparent level. So what we're doing is we're using McKinley to backdoor our way into Anthony, who's our actual direct descendant. Now we know that McKinley's wife's name is Minnie Lee Bradley from the obituary. We also know that some of these women were married because they had a different last name in the obituary. Now, these are the children. Those were his um, sisters that had different last names. So we're gonna go here to Anthony, which is his, so this is gonna be our actual descendant here because he's the father. He's gonna be the grandfather um, to my side. This is actually my actual family that we're looking at. So because of the obituary, it does not say the name of the wife. I just put an unknown because I don't like to leave things blank when it's something that I'm researching. So the one way that we can backdoor our way into finding out what is Mrs. Anthony Williams' name is we start off with our hints. The big thing about hints is that you do not want your hints to refer back to a family tree. They need to refer back to primary source documents because just like I can make my tree private, I can delete my tree. So if you have the tree as your citation, I can go in to try and you know, confirm, is this the right person? That person either A, has no documentation or B, there are times when that tree is not there or they have made suppositions that do not stand the test of time when you're looking at with your critical eye. Everything in your tree should be information that you feel confident belongs there. If you have a doubt about it, you will develop a system over time. And that's the other importance of continually doing your tree over and over. You will develop an instinct over time for information and the way that it's relayed because we now are living in a digital age, but this was done during an industrial age. So these documents, it doesn't translate apples to apples. There requires, you have to look at it from the time frame in which it was done. And that's from all perspectives. 
um, you know, what you see and what you don't see, who is in the neighborhood, who's not in the neighborhood, the occupations, the um, what's who's on the page before, who's on the page after. You look at the last names on the pages. It's very important to look at your documents. Um, we're gonna go probably a little faster than I would recommend for you guys to go on your first pass, just because this is a line that I know and we want to, and, you know, save time, but not save time. So here we have Anthony and Estelle. We're not sure, but oh, look, they have a child named McKinley. Odds are, this is going to be the name of the wife, the mother of this family. But we're gonna scroll down and just see, maybe we can find a, a marriage record. Like I'm truly doing this with you guys in real time. Oh, look at God. There we are. So we have Anthony Williams, we have a Moody Williams, and then there's a spouse of Stell Baker. Odds are, this is Moody's marriage record, not Anthony's. So let's see, scroll some more and see if we can find a marriage record for, oh, we see Anthony and Estelle for Tim and this is a social security application. That could be her name. We see it again. Um, scroll down, we see a death index. So we know, or I know, I should say, um, this is one of those points where we're gonna take a little creative license because I know these names and these people. These are things that, um, you just need to be aware of as you learn your, the names of your family. And for this one, it's a, a somewhat immediate relative, great grandfather. So I know that these are the right people. So this is how we start populating our tree. And oftentimes you will do it based on information that you already have. In times when you don't have information, you have to go a lot slower when you don't have that history to rely upon or people that you can call always People get so excited when you call them to talk about family history, when you call older family members. They will love to share their stories with you if you have that opportunity to reach out to those family members because there's so much information that you can get firsthand from your actual family members. So here we are, we are building out the tree of Anthony and Estelle. Estelle Beckham is the name of my great grandmother. So this is her line, my grandfather's line. We continue to build out this tree, add these names. Part of what we wanna do though, I wanna show you, um, I don't wanna go so fast just because of these documents I know. I wanna show you the information that you can find by looking at these documents. So we're gonna go back, I'm gonna add this one. What else? We're gonna, we're gonna finish adding the documents for Anthony and then I'm gonna go and actually start opening up the census records. It's very important that you open up the records and actually read them for yourself. The only reason why we're not doing it for here is because I know these people. But when you don't know, there's so much more that you can find. McKinley is who we started with. So this is still that same household um, that we are building. Thomas and Amy, Fanny, this was them. Yes, next, Thomas. So we have now added another generation. We're adding Thomas and Amy, which are the parents. So these are the grandparents of McKinley, which is the obituary that we started with. And we are moving our way back actually um, two generations from where we started. So now that's saving. Blah, 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 so. We're gonna go ahead and look at the facts now. So now we actually have facts to support the documentation that we have on our tree. We have the 1880 census, 1910, 1930. There's two 1930s, so that's probably a problem. We need to go back and look at. You always have to go back and verify your information because in my haste, I've done something. There should not be two 1930 censuses. So I need to figure out what I did there, although the scan looks the same. It may have just put in there twice. 
there will be multiple death indexes, multiple social security indexes, multiple marriage um, indexes, because those indexes are often for the children and it names the parent. And so that gives you that cross-reference for the child, the two parents, and then also the married name of the child. So that if you need to continue tracing that line that way, you can do it. But let's look at the 1880 census. This is the oldest one that we have here. We're going to view the image. Here they are highlighted. We have Thomas Williams with Amy. We have all of the children. Now in 1880, different censuses, since I, I don't know if that's the right word, have um, different information. So on some census records, it will tell you the year that they got married, the age they were when they got married. It will tell you the number of children that they have had and the number of children still living. So depending on the year, that can be very important information because you can figure out where a child's name may have dropped off. Um, that's not necessarily by marriage or having left the home. Um, if they say that I've had four children and there are two living and those two are in the household, then you know that there are previous children that you, know, you may or may not have documentation for depending on the year. For African-Americans in particular, Pre-1870, it is very difficult to find records because emancipation did not take place until 1865. And so a lot of documents are missing names because we are listed by age and gender and um, enslaver. That's the way that um, the records read. Then we look here at, you know, so we still have five hints left, but this is how we build out this tree. And we continue doing that throughout. We start to build, when we start to um, run out of information for Anthony, we start looking at his children to figure out where they are. So we, here we are, we see Mary in 1910. She's eight years old, that makes sense. Let's look at the hints. Can we find the 1920 census? Look, first one that pops up, we know. Autry, sounds like Anthony. Estella, we know that the mother's name is um, Stella. We know that there's a child, another child named Truman. So we are going to now add this record and this will add the record for everybody when we click the box. If you do not click the box next to the name, it will not add the record to the name. It will only add it to the ones that you have clicked. So if I decide that Tommy is not her relative for some reason, and I don't click Tommy's name, it will not show up either in the names nor will it show up with that documentation. So we're gonna make sure that we add Tommy. That's how we continue to grow our families over time. And this is how you do it when you do not have DNA. I know when we were asked the initial question, look at that, there's a timer, um, that a lot of you have not DNA tested, which makes it even more critical that you pay attention to the documents because you would be amazed at how many people in the world will have the exact same husband and wife, first and last name, and even two or three of the children in two totally different areas of the world, of the United States, unrelated to each other. If you click the wrong one, you will run down a rabbit hole that is not your family. I've done it. <laughs> I've been there, the queen of England. I, you couldn't have told me she wasn't my cousin. I believed we went at the end of the thing. I will show you a picture of us in England. You know, At this point, I knew that she wasn't my cousin, but that's our story and we're sticking to it. So um, you will have lots of those types of stories because you will find lots of documentation, lots of names that sound very familiar which makes it all the more important that you know for sure when you're adding information, you're adding your information. And so sometimes you have to err on the side of caution. So now we're back at the obituary and here's where we are. The leaves on ancestry are hints. They are not facts. You must verify everything you put in your tree. 
If you have a question about it, put it in your shoebox, make a note. You can make a, you know, an alternate type of documentation of it to come back and look at. But do not, you know, when you're putting it in your tree, you should really have, feel this is it because chasing down the wrong rabbit hole will lead you to other people's families. The point of this, most people are doing it is to find their family or the family of the individual who they started with. And so you have to be very rigorous about how you apply, um, you know, insert documentation. Um, you know, so I say, do not use other trees as evidence. A lot of times you will look at trees and you're comparing, and then you're like, wait a minute, hold on. Oh, let me see what other citations. They're not documents, another person's tree. You go to that tree, it shows five trees and you're like, well, which one do they get it from? And then you realize they all have the same wrong information. So you, because people copy trees because that's not the part that they teach you when you take, you know, when you look at the commercials, it just says, send in the sample, get it back, you know, you'll get an email and suddenly you'll know who you are. <laughs> yes, you will know who you are DNA wise, but putting the names and the stories to that requires work. And that's what I work to teach you. So now I'm going to check the document for questions. And there are some, awesome. Any DNA test that can ship to Sonora, Mexico? I am not sure what the current restrictions are on tests into foreign countries um, to go direct. What I do know and what I have seen done is that if you were able to get a test, you would get the test, send it, they would send it back to you, and then you would send the test in. There are workarounds for everything. Um, the same thing with, used to be on Ancestry, you could register multiple tests under the same email address. But because of private, privacy issues and things like that, they have put some um, roadblocks in place where they make each kit have its own email address unless it's a binder. And so because I have a lot of kits that I'm not, um, that I administer to family members to build that database of DNA family, they give me permission and when you put in, you change the birth dates and you're able to register them all under one email address because it's so hard. I have over 90,000 unread emails as it is. <laughs> and so adding another 20, 25 email addresses to that for specifically this when I'm the only one researching it. So that's just a conversation though that you need to make sure that you have full permission from the tester who's giving you the sample for you to have that authority over their DNA to overcome that obstacle. But um, that's the two, the full workaround for how you would manage that. So that's what I would say for Sonora, Mexico, is I would send them the test directly from yourself to them and then have them send it back to you. And then you mail it in within the States and then the information becomes available. And that's only because I don't know the, I don't know the restrictions or if there are even restrictions for Sonora, Mexico. Um, what types of primary sources do I recommend for research? The, the primary records that are available are all going to be transcribed or written by human beings. So um, census records are very important. Um, they give lots of information. I also strongly recommend when you are doing the census records to follow it back as far as you can, because oftentimes you'll find where there are marriages within a family and names change. And you won't know that the, what's presented as the mother in 1900, in 1880, it was a stepmother or a stepchild. And it was a different last name at that point. But as time goes on and relationships develop, names change, situations change. Like we know how complicated and complex families are in 2022. It was no different in any time frame of our ancestors. And so just based, and they had fewer restrictions and fewer laws to govern that. So like I know when my mother said she registered for school, 
mind you, she's not that old, but when she registered for school, she took the family Bible. Because if you wrote it in the Bible, it was gospel truth. And that's what, you know, um, that's in the, let's see, she, she graduated in the 60s from high school. So she would have um, started elementary school in the 1950s. It's not that long ago. It's, you know, in that time frame, that was the level of documentation that was required. My grandmother was not born with the middle name. She gave herself one. All her documentation from that point forward has a middle name. It's not anything that was ever, you know, legally done in terms of how we look at things being done today. So we always have to look at things through the lens of the time of the document. So that's the same thing when we're talking about primary source documents. What's available? And do the research around the collection of that data. Who was collecting the data? You know, what was the bias? Because all of these things influence the information. You will find, um, I found a marriage record for my great-great-grandfather. His last name is Chapman, but the record says Chattelman. My, I have family members who feel like that was a deliberate um, slight as chattel versus saying Chapman. So you have to look at the documents and read them. And you also have to understand that the people who are transcribing these documents don't know your family. So when we're looking at the cursive writing or the scribble of, you know, whatever, however fancy or not fancy the handwritten records are, they're being transcribed from a person who has no knowledge of any of these names. So they're transcribing it the way that they see it. And that's oftentimes why you will find transcription errors because they don't know what name they're looking for. And they're just trying to transcribe it based on what they see. So you have to be very diligent. When you start hitting your roadblocks, you wanna start going back to those documents, reading the pages before and after. If it's a smaller area where there's only, I say only you know, 50 to 60 pages in that particular district's um, census records, go through all of them. Start looking for names, last names, first name patterns, um, you know, near each other to try and figure out where you might have, you know, living next door is the daughter of, you know, now she has a different last name, but oh, we see here she is, age matches up, they're living right next door. We keep doing some research and we, you know, we find out, oh, here her mother is living with her 20 years later, she's a widow. So this is all information that you get from the really reading those documents. Um, and when you hit those brick walls, that's what you do is you go back and rebuild your tree and read the documents, both before the pages before and after the information that you have. Um, what type of membership version am I? I use the world the all access world version. The reason for that is because I don't just research for me. Um, really base it on the research level that you are at and make sure that when you're paying for your membership that you're getting your money's worth. Ancestry is expensive. <laughs> so you don't want to you know, look for the sales. They always have sales. Um, there are times where they will send you promotions for a dollar for a three buff block. Take advantage of those times. I always Google whenever my memberships are coming due, I always Google Ancestry coupon. <laughs> you know, you start looking for the best way around it. Um, during times where say you can't afford to do the Ancestry um, membership, that's where Family Search comes in, familysearch.org. All of the documents on Ancestry and all of these sites come from the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church, the family history centers. It is part of their religion that they connect back to the ancestors as the way to salvation. The way that we are able to take advantage of that relationship, to leverage that relationship is the documents. So they, part of their, um, they do pilgrimages and mind you, I am not an expert on the religion. So if I say something wrong, I apologize up front. This is the way that it looks to me um, in actuality. Um, dealing with genealogy. 
So those records are there and they go on um, mission trips where they go to these various courthouses all over the world, not just the United States, all over the world, scanning documents. They keep them in this mountain. Literally it's a mountain that they have blown out and turned into a temperature controlled um, vault for the scans of all of these documents that they have been collecting for since court documents have been a thing. <laughs> so a lot of times you're able to find documents that no longer are in existence because the courthouse is burned or various situations have happened and those documents no longer exist. The problem is getting all those documents in, um, indexed and transcribed. So they now say that they have everything digitized but not everything is indexed. So familysearch.org has all of these census records, all of this information is available for free. Their database, their, their user interface is not as sexy as Ancestry. It's not as user friendly. You have to work when you're using, um, it's a lot clunkier. If there are documents that are missing on Ancestry, but you see there's an FHL number, that's family history library. That means there is a scan of the actual document. You can see that scan if you go to a family research center, family history center, in your community. They're all over the United States, all over the world. They have family history centers. When you're using one of their computers, you can access the original images of documents that you can't find on Ancestry when it has that FHL number. Sometimes you can use that number and go into family search to find it by putting in that number. Sometimes it does come up, sometimes it doesn't. But you can always, if there's an FHL number, you can always get that document from the family um, familysearch.org, that's where they have um, the originals. And there's so much more information outside of the index that you can get, including finding transcription errors, finding out on death certificates, who is the informant, the cause of death, do they know the names of the parents, You know, what are the dates of the infirmary, what was the name of the funeral home? There's so much information that's not indexed. Um, I have found a person in someone else's family tree and 90% of the information is similar. But when I look at the tree, I don't see the connection and I have no idea who any of these other people are. Would you reach out to the owner to ask about the connection? Yes. Um, gently. And mindfully of the fact that it's very frustrating when you are a researcher and you're reaching out to someone who is not answering, or it says that they haven't logged in in three to 11 months. That little part of Ancestry, I don't know how accurate that is um, in terms of keeping track of really how long, but it kind of gives you a clue that maybe they're not active and they may or may not even have that email anymore. We talked earlier about the email addresses. And if you have to use multiple email addresses for something, if it's an old email address that they don't check anymore, it is easy for those answers and messages to never show up or to go into their junk. And so what I'm getting ready to do in a few minutes after we finish this, I'm gonna take um, maybe one more question. I'm gonna do one more question after this and then we'll do another period because I'm gonna to start to use the DNA because I see we're starting to get some DNA questions. And I wanna show you where we are in this tree and how we start now integrating the DNA information that we have to go with it. So I would just say to um, tread lightly, have a friendly conversation, try you know, to have a friendly banter in terms of the email that you send, send it and have no expectation. Hope for the best, but move on. Because if you just keep checking your email for that email to come in, it's not coming. <laughs> in the time that you would want it to. And the reason why sometimes you don't see that connection is because of Ancestry's algorithms and what they require, the level of shared symptom organs that they require in order to qualify it as a match. So that's where GEDmatch and other um, third-party sites become important because you can have a match to that person, but if it's under 20 CMs, in many situations, it will not show up as a match. You have to know where to go look for it at. Um, it just won't show up in like the, the cool tools that they give you. Okay, so we are now gonna go ahead and I am going to go to the DNA 
for what we were just dealing with. I have a DNA test on this line. It is not McKinley's test, but it is on the McKinley line. And so I can use that as a representative for this tree. So now we have our tree built out to a certain point. We've used the documents. We're at, you know, comfortable place in terms of where we are with the tree. We're starting to look for more supporting documentation. This is the DNA for DW. He's connected to a different tree, but it's the same line. So we can look at his through lines. We know that we are connected to Tom and Amy. Once again, through lines are hints, the same as leaves are hints. This information is only as accurate as the trees that the people have attached the information to. So that is the left, so you still have to verify. So this shows that 22 people say Tom, 20 say Amy. Interesting, why is there a difference? They're married. We start off though with looking at Tom. We see his children's, we see where DW comes in. This is our line. Um, you look at seven DNA matches, there's seven matches on that line. They're not all. So this is my cousin Dexton, DW. This is my line, this is my aunt, my uncle, my mother, myself and my kids. Um, we go back, it went too further back than I wanted it to. So we start looking at this and we see some of the other siblings. So now we see there are three people who have tested who say that Serena is Anthony's sister. We look at it, we look at the names. Luckily for this one, the way that it was done, it was done well, but we have names to go by. Um, and you actually look at that person's tree. As you see, it's 20 CMs, which seems like it's a small amount when you look at, I think the match for grandparents is like in the 17, and um, parents is like in the 1700 level. So 20 seems really, really small. It's not when you look at DNA inheritance and the randomness of it and the way that it gets diluted over time. So we look at this, we see her tree. It says Thomas and Amy are the common ancestors. We click, we look at her tree, we go to tree search. Let's put in. And they may not be in the tree. And sometimes you have to change spellings. So she only has Susie Williams in there. So this is curious because why, when Anthony is the relative, why does her tree stop at Susie? Mind you, once again, we are doing this in real time. So let's go back and look, where does Susie fall into? the mix. Go back to the through lines. What they are saying is, oh, look, Susie is actually Serena's child. So this is, and Serena is Thomas's child. So now you go back and you look at Serena. So let's figure out, like, can we connect Serena to Tom? You have to make the connection. If you can't make the connection, do not add them to your tree. They may not be correct because once again, this is self-reporting. This is another person's research that you are relying upon. So we're gonna look at this 1880 census. Okay, we see a Serena, she's one years old. Look, look Tom and Amy. We can now add Serena. Then we build out from Serena to Sally. Now we can add those other names to the tree as we find the documentation to support it. But we always want to confirm the information. I know I'm probably gonna say that 5 million times and that's because it's that important. And you will develop your own style over time. 
in terms of how you research and how you document and how you confirm. When I research, sometimes if I see a name, the way that I do, I put it in unknown and then last name. So let me show you um, where we did that at. We had the obituary that we started with. We have McKinley's children that were listed. Actually, it was McKinley's siblings that were that way, who had different last names. We know that Amy's last name in the obituary said Dungey, but if she's his sibling, her, last, her maiden name is Williams. So when I added her to the tree, I put in unknown Dungey. Everybody has different ways that they do it. This is how I do it. It has no name. We have 11 hints for Amy. We click on the hints because we're looking for a name for our unknown Dungey. This says there's a picture of Amy. I can tell you that is her, but we're gonna pretend like we don't know that. So oh, look at this. We have an obituary. The obituary. Amy Dungey, we know that's her name. We know when Alabama, we know this is about that time frame. Ernest R. Dungey is who we have for her husband's name. We now, well, here Ernest, and so we have, un, this shows your tree detail. So in my tree, it says unknown. In the record I'm looking at, it says Ernest R. Dungey. If I click here, that now changes it in my record. You can do the same thing when you have spelling errors or you find records where there's a middle name listed as the first name, but then you find an actual record that will give you the whole name. So now we can add all of these Dungy children. To the tree and we backtrack that and continue to confirm it with the DNA. So you go back and forth between the records and the DNA because as you find living people to connect back, you can confirm those familial groups the way that they are documented. Um, now you can document it biologically in addition to paper trail wise. And you just keep going back and forth doing that until you have your whole tree. And so we did that, it probably took us, I mean, 40 minutes to do that, to have a pretty solid foundation, but there is still a good four or five hours worth of documents just in the names that we have. And with each name you get, there's gonna be more names and you just keep going. So here we are again, once again, remember, leaves are hints. Through lines are hints. <laughs> Verify everything. Do not use other trees as evidence. I also question other genealogists, other family historians, other you know, professionals. I want to see the documentation for myself to come to my own conclusion. There was a time where I relied on another genealogist who was a known historian for a particular area. I relied on the information that she gave me as true. I found somebody who I DNA tested who did not show up the way that they should have. So then I was like, I'm confused because everything matches. I come to find out that two families with the same um, units, it was a mother, daughter in both households, same two first names, living three pages away in census documents had been combined into one family the entire group. So that was where um, the confusion continued to grow because we relied on information that was not my own. This is the picture I promised you. This is me and my family in London in front of um, the palace. Uh, all but four of these people are direct relatives to the McKinley line that we spoke of. So. Um, we really did go to the palace looking for our cousin, the queen. She didn't come out, maybe next time, um, we'll see. Maybe we'll send a letter next time. <laughs> so now we are next to our final question and answer period. Um, let's see. 
other programs, right? So we talked about Family Search as um, another program. How do you read your DNA results? Next month, we're doing a talk on DNA doesn't lie. So that will go more deeply into the DNA because the other reality of DNA is that the paperwork is the understood and accepted explanation for much of the, re the paper research, but the DNA does not always track the same. So it expands family, not shrinks it, but it's still a reality that has to be dealt with. And um, that's where the absolutes come in. When we talk about primary source information, I, DNA is the only primary source information that is absolute. Everything else has to be looked at with a critical eye. So um, yeah, we talk about that. And that's the reason for the use of DNA. Um, there are a lot of people who um, have apprehension about the use of DNA. I get it. But at this point in this stage of the game, you not doing DNA is not going to stop anybody else from being able to be found. Like your DNA is not going to be the reason why little Tommy goes to jail because um, it's being used for criminal um, investigations. There's still a level of evidence and proof that is required and odds are just because you haven't tested, I find people all the time who have never tested based on the matches that are in common and figuring out the, um, the relationships and finding that out. So you're denying yourself information, bite your nose, bite your face because it's already out there. That's just my take on it. And living in a digital age where access is what it is, that's just my take. Um, everybody has to do what they're comfortable with at the end of the day. Because if you develop um, free on Ancestry and then end your subscription, are you able to take that tree with you? Not on Ancestry, but there is a program called, um, I think I gave you the link for it. It's um, Family Tree Maker. Download your tree to Family Tree Maker. You can sync it back and forth, but that way the documents in your tree live on your computer so that when you do not have an active subscription, you still have access to the documents. Because the day you stop paying Ancestry is the day you stop having access to your information. Your tree is still there. Your information is still there. The documents are still there, but you will not have access. So make sure to always back up your trees onto a third party program. The one that I prefer is Family Tree Maker. There are others. That's just the one that I prefer and works best for me. Um, and it syncs back and forth. It also syncs with um, familysearch.org. So you can um, attach links to both of those to find documents, download the actual documents to your tree, um, to your computer so that you can look at them later during times when you um, are not paying for a subscription. Um, what are CMs? I'm sorry. CMs are centimorgans. That is the unit of measure for chromosomes. That's how they just um, determine relationships. So I don't know the exact number, but it's around 34, 3,500 CMs that each person has. So when your father's side, you get half. Your mother's side, you get half. Sometimes it's off by one or two, maybe a little bit more, but you know, um, averaging 50% 50, 50 for each side. And they measure the overlap. The amount of overlap on um, each chromosome is how they determine relationships. So if you overlap on one chromosome at, we'll say 10 CMs, you can be up to, I think, like a third cousin a couple of times removed, or and if it's a half relationship, even further. That's another thing to consider when you're looking at CMs and relationships is consider half relationships because a half relationship is gonna be actual, in actuality twice as close as it looks. It'll look like a fourth cousin, but it's actually a, a half second cousin. So these are things to um, keep in mind when you're looking at relationships, especially when you already know it's a half relationship. 
So that's CMs. How much should we expect to pay when working with professionals such as yourself? I don't do research that way, primarily because of the time that it takes. And so that was a large part of the way that I developed this organization to make it affordable and to teach, uh, to teach people how to do their own research. So as affordable option, what I have um, through my website, you can book consultations, 30 minutes for $25, an hour for $40. What I'll do is look at your results, look at your information, and I will tell you what you should do next based on where you're at. And so I can be your research coach. You then take the time to chase down that research. And whenever you get to certain points, you can log in, um, book a consultation, and I'll give you that research. Because you can pay upwards of, I mean, Ancestry has a ridiculous um, program for professional research that is in the thousands of dollars for very few hours worth of actual research. And more often than not, you're gonna end up with the same information that you already have, but just it'll look cleaner. It'll be in a neater folder, you know, um, better packaged. Your money is better spent finding actual specific researchers in the specific locations who can go to the actual courthouses, pull documents that you can't find other ways, Otherwise, probate records, things like that. I personally don't recommend um, paying a researcher unless you just, you know, you're flowing like that and you want to share the wealth. But I don't do research that way because of the amount of time that it takes. I would have to, you know, juice two or three clients really hard to make it, um, you know, worthwhile to do. And so I just prefer to teach others how to do their own research because research is never done. And that's just... Me and my thing, everybody does it different. We got three minutes, let's see. Um, DNA test show some type of deadly degenerative disease. Do not, okay, I won't say do not, I do not use DNA test for genetic testing. Direct to consumer contesting, um, testing, I do not believe should be used for medical genetic testing because you need a qualified professional to read those results and to give you true information on how to handle those results. There is genetic testing being you know, available through your healthcare providers that is far more responsible and productive than using the DNA test. That's just my thing. So I, my full sentence on that. Um, my heritage is like ancestry.com. Their app database is not as large. So, and they have a larger percentage of European DNA. So if you're really looking in the European side, you would add to that. What I tell people is to pay for the test for 23andMe and for Ancestry. Download your raw DNA data from one of those tests to upload to MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, and GEDmatch. Um, MyHeritage, I think it's like a 30 something dollar fee to upload. Family Tree DNA is free and GEDmatch is free to upload if you wanna access their tools, which we will talk about next month. Um, it's $10 a month while you're researching and you do that month to month. So that is an economic way to um, do research, but it's next level and you have to um, have a well-developed tree and sense of direction in order to make that happen. And I can actually help you with that. Um, I can get back a hundred years. My family lived in Central Africa and it seems a black hole for records. Any advice? Pray. Um, I don't, I'm really sorry for that. Um, try and contact maybe some of your DNA cousins through one of the sites who are native born and see if you can, um, find what your connection is. So it's amazing that you're able to even go back that far, but to actually, um, get to records of people outside of um, map ship manifests for the enslaved. I do not know any um, of any local records that I could directly um, direct you to. And hopefully one day I will be. So follow us on Instagram and our genetic legacy. As I find out more, I share more. Um, last question on intersex. And so while I was declared female at birth and all my state records say female, my chromosomes are actually X, Y. Will this make it hard for future family members to find me using apps like this? Yes. 
Um, that's just the reality of the current climate of the software. It's binary, it's, um, you know, absolute. We are in a new age where um, definitions and things like that are changing. 10 years from now, five years from now, it may be a totally different story in terms of how the um, user interface works, how the algorithms work, how they deal with the changes in society. Um, based on what I know right now, it, it leans towards A or B. It's just the way that it is. Um, time will show how that works. And that, everyone, leads us to the end. We are at noon. I thank you all so much for spending this hour with me and look forward to seeing some of you next month when we do DNA Doesn't Lie. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Shelly. I'm gonna give everyone just a moment to save the chat if they would like to do so. And I'll also click on unmute in case you'd like to say a, a, a thank you or a goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Shelly. That was really Thank fun. You all. It was terrific. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I was able to help you all. You were. Definitely. Great. All right. See you next month. In three, two, one. Have a good one, everyone. <laughs>